is Su Lin Lee. Um, I'm a lecturer at Imperial College at the Hamlin Center. Um, unlike my esteemed uh, members of the panel, I am not a clinician. So I, I like to say I'm the kind of the wrong kind of doctor. So if somebody on the airplane says, is there a doctor in the house? I try to make myself as small and as quiet as possible. Um, I'm an engineer, and I'm one of many engineers at the Hamlin Center. So let me just introduce the center to you. Well, we're based at Imperial College, which is, this is its campus down at South Kensington. And the Hamlin Center was established approximately five years ago. And as it says in the, 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 the kind of catchphrase here, our focus is on technological innovation with a strong emphasis on clinical translation and direct patient benefit. So we focus on three main research areas, and that's imaging, sensing, and robotics, all, of course, for surgical and medical innovation. Uh, like I said, we, uh, I'll show you soon actually where we're exactly based in London, and that which actually helps us with clinical translation and direct patient benefit. And as we're actually the umbrella institution um, over us is actually the Institute of Global Health Innovation, we do focus on global health challenges and affordable technologies. So, like I said, we're actually... We're actually, we're very much lucky to actually have a number of campuses actually um, based at Imperial College. So in terms of the Hamlin Center, I'm here based at the, um, at the South Kensington campus where all the teaching, undergraduate teaching of course goes on. However, we also have part of the Hamlin Center up here at the St. Mary's campus and that allows us to actually directly collaborate with many of the clinicians up there. And finally, we actually have, up at Northwick Park, that's, if you're not familiar where that is, it's Zone 4, North London, we actually have a preclinical research facility as well, which allows us to actually test the technologies that we're actually developing. So just to give you a quick overview of what we have on each site, here's the Bessemer Building in South Kensington. Um, you're welcome to come and visit. We've got lots of uh, surgical technologies that are under development there. At the Patterson Wing, again, number of the surgical technologies and the ability to actually recruit lots of clinicians and end users to test our technologies. And finally, this is Northwick Park Hospital where we actually have a full um, imaging facility for preclinical testing. So, Lord Kekar mentioned networks. Well, I'd like to actually introduce you to, to also the EPSRC UK Robotics and Autonomous Systems Network, aka UK RAS. And this is actually headed up by the Hamlin Centre. And the aim of this is actually to consolidate a lot of the academic research in robotics and autonomous systems across the UK so that we have actually have um, a, a base with which to actually communicate with other, with industry and collaborate with all of them. And the aims of the network are, it's not just medical technology, it's all kinds of robotics as well. So we can see here transport, healthcare, manufacturing, and unmanned um, robotic systems. So if you're actually interested in, in taking part in this, do talk to me during one of the breaks as I can get you in touch with our network manager. Um, we also have, we're very lucky to have um, a very large investment by the EPSRC, that's the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. Um, to put together a microengineering facility for medical robotics. So we have quite a large number of, um, of devices to actually create these um, micro and nano robots, and they're actually, it's actually open for use for any academics or even um, industry. So just to kind of briefly go through what's been happening in terms of image guidance and surgical technology, um, over the years, I think you'd, kind of recognize that surgical surgery has kind of got, undergone this huge change from open surgery where you know you are actually physically opening somebody up all the way to minimally invasive surgery with the introduction of laparoscopic surgery and then now robotic laparoscopic surgery and now we're moving into kind of these areas in terms of innovation when it comes to flexible access surgery transluminal surgery and i think the technology has kept up with that and we now are able to do these kind of procedures I mean, just to go through, in terms of commercial devices and robotic technologies, this, for example, is the, um, the Zeus. It was one of the very first clinically used surgical robots for laparoscopic surgery. The picture size here doesn't seem to indicate it, but it is one massive kind of big robot um, that's no longer in use. You might um, recognize this. This is the, um, actually, you know, that, that one, actually, is the Da Vinci system by Intuitive, and that one's actually in use all around the world, mainly for prostatectomies, uh, but we're using it for other, um, 
other innovation as well, since the company has actually been so kind enough as to actually open up their framework and actually allowed many academic institutions to actually develop directly on their platform. But these systems are large. They're cumbersome. They're big, as you can see here. These are master-slave systems where the clinician is sitting at one station and the patient's here underneath this drape here with another very large system actually controlling the robotic arms themselves, the robotic laparoscopes and the tools themselves. They are large. They have a large footprint in the theater. We're actually looking to move, make things smaller, looking at small, flexible devices, handheld devices, handheld devices with sensors, with haptic feedback, micro-robotics, nano-robotics, and that's the focus of the Hamlin Center. We're hoping that we can develop smaller, more intuitive devices that hopefully, because of their size, they'll be more affordable, and because of their intuitivity, intuitivity more people will be able to use them. So I'll discuss very briefly now on my expertise, which is on endovascular systems. I have to say thank you for Lord Kakar to actually introduce this very briefly. So in terms of endovascular, if you're not familiar with the procedure itself, when it comes to endovascular um, procedures, these are minimally invasive procedures whereby you're actually introducing very, very thin guide wires and catheters, not dissimilar to this kind of cable here, through your femoral or iliac artery, and then it's fed up all the way up your aorta. And then depending on where you need to go, you may need to have a stent graft um, implanted. It may need to go all the way to the heart for electrophysiology procedures. Well, commercially, there are a number of well-established robotic systems to aid with this. So on the left is the Hansen Magellan robotic system. That's the only robotic catheter system for arterial interventions. On the right is the Stereotaxis Niobe. That's for cardiology and for EP procedures. The technologies differ ever so slightly. On the left-hand side, it's a pull wire system, so it's driven by the tip of the catheter itself. On the right-hand side, as you can kind of gather from these massive bulkheads here, and I have to say they are absolutely massive, this is a magnetically driven system. So these bulkheads actually move along, create the magnetic field, which pulls along the catheter to where you want to go. Now, the benefits of using these kinds of robotic systems over manual catheterization, well, they're pretty clear. There's increased precision and stability of motion. There's reduced tremor. There's added operator comfort, which the companies love to promote because, the, obviously, the, um, the end users are sitting either outside the actual operating theater or just at least elsewhere from the patient itself, themselves. And due to that, there's reduced radiation exposure because these procedures to actually see within the body are performed with X-ray fluoroscopy. Now, that's all bad. X-ray fluoroscopy is bad. I just want to make that really clear. It's just continuous X-rays to the actual patient. And, and my work is actually looking to see if we can actually remove the X-rays from this entire picture to make things a little more safe for, for not only the patient but for the operator as well. So in terms of the, I'm just going to go through all the research when it comes to actually endovascular technologies here uh, at the Hamlin Center. So one of the, the bits of work that we've been doing is actually trying to integrate sensing into the catheters themselves, not just at the distal end, at the catheter tip end, but at the proximal end as well, uh, so where the actual clinician is actually moving and manipulating the catheter. And from those, can we actually determine, you know, what kind of uh, motions the actual clinician is actually go is, are actually doing. And with these kinds of motion, can we actually then program future um, endovascular motions of the catheter itself? And if we can learn from the experts, we can then train these robots to actually perform like the experts and thus have much safer procedures. We're actually looking at creating our own endovascular catheter robot as well. And we're looking to actually utilize the skills of the experts themselves. So rather than, and, and the previous commercial systems, what they tend to have is, is, a, is a kind of um, joystick control, which is not entirely intuitive and does require quite a bit of training to actually get used to it. We're looking to see whether we can actually create um, much smaller robotic catheters, again, based on a master-slave system here, but utilizing the actual skills of the, of the um the experts to actually manipulate the catheters themselves. We're also looking at enhanced visualization. So this is my former work in which I'm actually trying to remove X-ray images out of the equation. And in this case, we're looking at simulating endovascular intervention using what I call a virtual endoscopic view. 
so where you're actually mimicking a, ca a camera at the end of the actual um, catheter and kind of driving through it, kind of like, well, like our clinician says, it's kind of like you're driving your car through Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> That's fine, fair enough. So one particularly new area we're actually working on is actually robotic stent manufacturing. And, um, well, I'll leave actually this video to explain it all. Improved manufacturing of personalised stem grafts is a critical, unmet clinical demand that requires innovative manufacturing solutions. This project is an exciting step towards that direction. So I'd just like to thank, it's not just me obviously, it's a large team. Not all of them working on, on endovascular technologies, but it's a large team at the Hellman Centre. So thank you very much. Uh, let me ask you both one question. I'll open it to the audience. I'm, I'm kind of conscious of time. Um, we, we've heard that actually these things do take time. Robotic surgery, I think, started in about 1985. Um, in terms of the biggest barriers to accelerate things, uh, is it legal, ethical, regulatory, cost? What, what, what do you both see as the, the, the biggest impediments to pace of change? All of that. <laughs> <laughs> regulatory, at least in... From, from my point of view, in terms of as a, 
as the as the technical innovator, yes, regulatory is a big one. And to get through that, then there's the cost of that and the time it takes to go through all the testing. So I'd say all of that, <laughs> all together in one. Yeah, I think it's it's very different depending on the healthcare system in which you work. So if you are in a profit-driven commercial healthcare sector like the US, they very much have these bump and falls. So they have a new technology adopted pretty often very quickly. Some work and then they become standard of care. Many fail and they, but they have a huge excitement, massive investment, often great disappointment. Then you have NHS England, which is probably the complete opposite of that. Very, very, very slow. So we are very slow adopters of technology in this country. Um, and, but actually when we do adopt it, tend to do it um, rigorously and test it properly. And so there are advantages and disadvantages. And I think somewhere between those two is probably where we, where we want to be. I would like to see us accelerate our way we adopt technology, but equally I don't think we should adopt the US model of just trying something because it looks right and actually you can make a lot of money out of it quickly. That in healthcare is a dangerous way. Um, we should test things properly, but we need to commit to do it more quickly. Thank you. So let's take a couple of questions from the floor and then we'll move on to the next session. Here in the front. In this uh, world of innovation uh, and robotic surgery, there it seems to be a battleground for commercial interests, the big ideas. How do you ensure, since it affects so many lives, Um, do you want to answer that? Or? Mm, no. uh, I mean, it, it, well, it, it, that I think by testing things properly in, in clinical trials, you, uh, you have a way of eliminating mistakes. With robotic surgery, we know for certain there's a, there is a learning curve for an individual surgeon, um, and they, you know, every <laughs> surgeon who trains on this technique has to go through a, a learning curve. A lot of that can now be done in simulatory environments so that you're not actually operating on real patients, which, but you still, at some point, you have to operate on real patients and there is always gonna be a learning curve. Um, so there's, there's safety in training and then for technologies like mine, it's, it's evaluating them in, in clinical trials that, that should test whether they are, you know, they are safe and I think that question really comes to the fore when you're talking about things like autonomous robotics. So this is something actually Lord Kekar and I discussed actually before the actual session. As he, he asked me, do I think that we're at that stage yet? And I think we're very far from that stage. Um, partially because, no offense meant, but I do find actually a lot of clinicians are very hesitant to actually adopt that technology and to kind of give up the control. But I do feel there is a place for the surgeon. There always will be a place for the surgeon. They're the ones with the experience. They're the ones with the knowledge. And it's not always possible to program these robots with all that knowledge. Um, <coughs> I was wondering, it's maybe really special about this, but uh, transplantable 3D printed organs have been around for a couple of years. And I was wondering, looking ahead, when they would perhaps be commercially available more normal? Totally out of my comfort zone, I'm afraid. Um, not so, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you. I'm aware yeah. of some of the 3D printed technologies. There's a company in Belgium, Materialize, who's very much um, doing a lot of this. I'm not sure about organs, though. I know about bones and mm. you know, skull plates and whatnot, and those can all be customized and personalized, which is really the way I think medicine is going to go. Um, some of it's already available. I mean, I don't know what you mean by commercial, as in, you know, off the shelf, here's my brain, here's my, <laughs> my new kidney, but I mean, a lot of these can be personalized now. One more, final one. Uh, the, so the primary endpoint is um, disease control at five years, and the secondary endpoints are in, they're about 20 of which um, overall survival, disease-free survival, but they're predominantly toxicity endpoints. So comparing patient reported quality of life, uh, so it's things like bladder function, rectal function, sexual function, 
are all being recorded at baseline and then at, at all time points in the study. And what we act, it's designed as something called a non-inferiority study, which means that we expect the treatments to end up being equivalent for disease control. Um, and in fact, we do very well at this end of the disease in con con controlling and curing it already. So we don't expect a big difference. What we expect is a big a difference in quality of life. And costs, yeah, costs are very difficult to do in an international study because the costs are very different in different healthcare systems. So although we've tried to work in a cost-effective endpoint, it's very difficult to, to do that across multiple healthcare systems. Um, thank you. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, we need to move to the next panel. Uh, Mark, Jason Channel, the host of the uh, New Energy Technologies, uh, and ask our panel. Thank you.